The house will come to order. <laughs> Messages from the Senate. Message, message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce that the Senate has concurred in and adopted the report of the Conference Committee on Senate File Number 2415, an act rela relating to higher education. The message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. The Conference Committee report is addressed to the Je Honorable Jeremy R. Miller, President of the Senate, the Honorable Melissa Hortman, Speaker of the House. We, the undersigned conferees for Senate File Number 2415, report that we have agreed upon the items in dispute and recommend it as follows. The Conference Committee report is signed by all five conferees on the part of the Senate and all five conferees on the part of the House. Bernardi moves that the report of the Conference Committee on Senate File Number 2415 be adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Conference Committee. I recognize the member from Anoka, the author of the bill, Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. It's an honor to be standing before you today presenting our Higher Education Omnibus and Finance Bill. We worked through the night and we were able to come up with a compromise today. As many of you know, when this bill passed the House floor, we had a tuition freeze to help support our students at our two and four-year public colleges and universities. Education and higher education has be be become difficult for families and students to obtain. So we have invested in our students in our bill and we are we're disappointed for it coming back how it did with less than half the money, but we did the best we could with it and we have a plan that supports our students and it's student standard from students that are aspiring to go to college and encouraging them to, for students who are struggling and need help to stay into college, for students who have quit college and are carrying student debt and need to go back to finish their degrees. We have different measures in this program to really help our students and families. There's three major components in the omnibus bill, which include the higher education funds for our state grant program and the Office of Higher Education. In the state grant program, we provide over $18 million of new funding and $20 million of carryover money. This money will help over 4,300 new students into the program, as well as provide over $200 on the average for students to help support them in their schoolwork. In our bill, we also have measures to help students uh, with mental health needs, as well as helping um, start a new initiative to help make our campuses uh, hunger free. We also have initiatives that will help students get into the workforce in areas that are that there is a need for workers as well as shortages in different regions and teacher grant programs where teachers are doing their student teaching and it's very difficult to quit, quit their jobs and to be able to work for free and you know they always have to pay for those tuition free the tuition as well and so our grant provides another one and a half million dollars for that and the funds focus on helping our students of color and our indigenous students get into the teaching field. I'm really proud of our conference committee and our members who have participated in our higher education committee. Just want to call out Ben Lean and Ginny Cleavorn and Lori Pryor, all representatives, and want to thank them and our staff that's been amazing, which is Bennett Smith as well as Addie Miller and Sean Herring and all the other staff who has made this possible from our nonpartisan staff, Nathan Hopkins and Ken Savory. There's a lot of other people that were involved in it, but the main person that we centered this bill was around our students. So everyone who came to testify at our committee, from our students to parents, to faculty, to administrators, to tribal nations, and to our young people in college, and our students that are returning students at a later age in life. We are here for you. We are trying to address the the high costs of college and make it more affordable and keep high quality college and 
we are working towards ending and reducing student debt. We have a loan debt, we have a loan debt program in this where students across Minnesota and people facing student debt can get help in loan counseling. So members, I urge you to support our bill, help students across the state, and help support our value in Minnesota of having higher education that really helps advance the quality of life, the, the love of Minnesota that we have, and be able to have the um, kind of support for their children and families by having a strong career and um, being able to make Minnesota great with a great workforce. Thank you very much. I, I ask you to vote yes. Is there any discussion to the motion to adopt the conference committee report? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by conference. Third reading, Senate file number 2415, as amended by conference. Third reading. Discussion. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. If the author of the conference report would yield for a question. She will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, Representative Bernardi, I'm just reviewing the spreadsheet. I don't see any revenue in the bill, uh, tax revenue or non-tax revenue. Can you just clarify and confirm that for me? The member from Anoka, Representative Bernardi. Uh, Representative Garofalo, we do not put in the tax revenue in our bill. We have the budget that we need for our bill, which the bill is $150 million. And before you ask another question, I do want to uh, ask for forgiveness from Representative Nornes. He was a valuable member of our conference committee, too, and want to thank him. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, Madam Speaker, thank you, uh, Representative, Representative Garofalo. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> so, no, Representative Bernard, I just wanted to make sure I did not see any non-tax revenue in the spreadsheet. I just wanted to confirm that. You've confirmed that. Thank you. Um, members, just for uh, an idea here of where um, this is compared to the last budget, uh, this is $115 million above last biennium's budget. It's $150 million above base, but it's actually... Um, base was $35 million lower than the last session. So that works out to a less than a 3.5% increase in the fu and, uh, higher education funding, which actually is um, a lot better than I was expecting it to come back. But the problem, Madam Speaker members, is that we don't know where the tax bill is right now. And appearing on the preliminary numbers that have been shared publicly, um, I, don't, I don't know where the leadership tribunal is with things right now in terms of determining what's happening, but um, it looks like there's going to be a substantial general fund tax increase in the tax bill. And so I don't feel comfortable uh, voting for this knowing that it's financed by tax increases. So Madam Speaker, members, uh, I would recommend a no vote on, on the conference report. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Representative Nornis. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I just want to say thank you for the, uh, the year we've spent, or not a full year, but part of a year, dealing with higher education. Uh, Chair Bernardi, it's uh, been fun to be on the committee with you uh, as a lead Republican. Uh, this, this bill is generally the first to get out of this uh, in the process of, of finishing up. We're a little late this year, but we're at least going to make it, I think, which is a good thing. I just have a quick question of the author. She will yield. Representative Nornis. I know there was talk about freezes in tuition, and uh, as far as the university is concerned, you're indicating a 3% maximum. Is that for each year, or would that be for the total of the next two years? Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Representative Nornis, for asking that question. We did, ex the language that the Republicans wanted to put into the bill was to cap tuition at 3% for each year. We had a tuition freeze for students across Minnesota in our two-year and four-year public colleges. It came back with a 3% tuition freeze for each year. Okay, thank Representative you. Representative Nornis. Yeah. That seems like a fairly generous uh, offer to the university. But, uh, as far as Minnesota State uh, is concerned, there's no reference in that uh, language pertaining to tuition or, or possible increases. Uh, if, if the chair would uh, yield one more time. She will yield, Representative Nornis. The, the question is, what is the feeling as far as that system is concerned regarding a possible tuition increase? Representative Bernardi. 
Uh, Representative Nornis, you're talking about Minnesota State, correctly? Correct. We, as a legislator, have, have legislature have the authority to be able to tell them uh, what we want them to do. And although we left the, this left this body with a tuition freeze, we it was cut in half of what we could support our our universities. And so the there has been a provision that it's a 3% cap on each, and our universities feel that they can keep their quality program within the parameters in which the legislature set forward. But our students are going to be carrying the burden rather than the state of Minnesota providing the funding. The member from Otter Tail, Representative Nornis. Okay, thank you for that response. Um, members, um, you know, there are things you can always find that are not right or that you don't feel comfortable with. Helping our students at the higher level of both the university and Minnesota state system and the private colleges and the for-profits, I think that it's a responsibility we have and, and I think this, this bill meets that threshold as far as I'm concerned, but it's not perfect for everybody, but uh, I will be voting green. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would just like to recognize the hard work of our chair, Chair Bernardi. She was relentless in advocating for our students. And so as a first termer, um, being able to work on a conference committee was a great honor. And it was amazing just to see the values that our chair brought to that committee. But also, I would like to make sure that we recognize the Minnesota councils that also helped in us uh, forming a very good bill for the students of the state of Minnesota. And those four councils consist of the uh, Minnesota Council of African Heritage, the Minnesota Council of Asian Pacific Islanders, the, Council, the Minnesota Council of Latino Affairs, and let's see, I'm, am I forgetting someone? Oh, I'm sorry, of the uh, Minnesota Council of African Heritage. So thank you very much. Is there any further discussion to the bill as amended by conference? The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, here we are at the end of session, or nearly. We have about an hour and 15 minutes until the constitutional end of session. Uh, this is the first budget bill that hopefully, if debate is brief here, we'll make it to the governor's desk tonight. And it looks like this will be the only one. So as you celebrate your successful session, this is the least amount of work that has been accomplished in a legislative session since 1985. This will be the least number of bills that have been finished and sent to a governor's desk since 1985. It's a lot to be proud of. Representative Winkler, uh, with me on Almanac the other night, said, in the end, all bills will be public, they will be posted, they will go through a conference committee process. There will be plenty of opportunity to weigh in. And at this stage, it feels like this is the most productive way to negotiate. Thank you, Representative Winkler, for your calls for transparency. Unfortunately, those are false words. This has been the least transparent legislative session in the history of this state. You have the fewest number of bills sent to the governor's desk since 1985. It's impossible for members of this chamber to read even this bill before coming here to vote on it. And what we get from Democrats is more empty promises. You said you wanted transparency. You said you were going to do it different. And boy, have you done it different. The Higher Ed Conference Committee met one time and only met to adopt the agreement that had been worked out in secret. That's the transparency that Representative Winkler demanded just a few nights ago. House Democrat leadership, after this bill had been completed by Conference Committee, actually reopened it, taking that power away from the legislators who made the agreement and changed the agreement. They didn't even let the legislators work out the differences. In November of 2018, 
Hortman said, I think Minnesota will be far better off having all 201 legislators engaged in the lawmaking process. My, how times have changed. How many lawmakers were engaged in the creation of this bill? And our leaders right now, the Leadership Tribunal is meeting in secret in 15-minute blocks, working out the difference in all of the other bills. No public process, no transparency, and no one will know what you are doing. And my guess is, based on what you put in these bills, that's exactly what you want. This has been the worst, least productive, and least transparent session in the history of this state. Congratulations, Democrats. You have done it differently. I'd suggest a no vote on this bill. Any further discussion? The member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Winkler. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, and I want to uh, particularly thank uh, Representative Bernardi for her excellent work in higher education and all the conferees and committee members who put this bill together. We know that this bill is not enough. This legislative session uh, is a representation of divided government in which the default seems to be the status quo. We have managed to preserve uh, critical health care funding for Minnesotans. We are managing to handle uh, some increases for K-12 funding, and we are able to invest more money in higher education and to reduce the increase of tuition growth. Uh, but members, uh, we know that this is not enough. This budget session is just the beginning of what Democrats in the Minnesota House what Governor Walls and soon Democrats in the Minnesota Senate will be bringing to the state of Minnesota. Investments in the things that make a difference in people's lives. Affordable, accessible higher education, affordable, accessible health care, high quality schools, high quality early learning available for every child, economic security for every family, and a system of taxation that is fair and based on the ability to pay. That's what the future is. That's what this bill represents. It's a step forward towards a much better future for the state. And uh, members, I would uh, ask you to vote green on this bill. And members of the public, I would suggest you pay attention because the future is starting with this legislative session. Seeing no further discussion. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill as amended by conference. The clerk will close the roll. There being 84 ayes and 49 nays, the bill is passed as amended by conference and the title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. <clears throat> Winkler moves that the rules be so far suspended that Senate file number 973, now on the general register, be given its third reading and be placed upon its final passage. I call upon the uh, author of the motion, the member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. Representative Winkler. Madam Speaker, we have a bill that is on the general register that is uh, by consent of uh, all three caucuses going to be uh, taken up immediately. So the suspension of the rules allows us to do that without scheduling a rules committee meeting and slowing down proceedings. Discussion to the motion to suspend the rules. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would encourage members to support that motion. This was a Republican bill and a Republican uh, provision in the omnibus bill that was vetoed by Governor Dayton last year, and we would appreciate uh, your support so we can get it passed now and signed. Uh, all those in favor of the motion for suspension of the rules, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails. The clerk will report the bill.
file number 973, an act relating to health. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Man moves to amend Senate file number 973. The unofficial engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A2. The member from Dakota, Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this amendment offers uh, language regarding appropriation that conforms to the Senate language. And is there any discussion to the amendment? Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm wondering if the majority leader or if the author to the amendment, we still haven't had a description of exactly what uh, the bill or this amendment is doing. What, please give more detail on what it is this language is seeking to do. Are you asking somebody to yield, Representative Mann, perhaps? I'm asking the majority leader or Representative Mann, either one. Representative Mann will yield. Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Representative. So on the House bill, we had a two-year appropriation. The Senate bill has a four-year appropriation, so we just amended our language to match the Senate language. Madam Speaker? Representative Lucero. Uh, Madam Speaker, would Representative Mann yield for another question? She will yield. Representative Lucero. Uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Mann, appropriation for what? Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I will go over what the bill does, but don't I do that when the third reading of the bill and not the amendment? No? Okay. So, um, so what file 973 will do is establish a rare disease advisory council in the state of Minnesota. Uh, again, the amendment offered just conforms to the Senate language as far as the appropriations go. The state of Minnesota has long been a leader in medical advancement and patient care with institutions like the Mayo Clinic, the U of M, and other world-class hospital systems, people from all over the world travel to get their care here in Minnesota. However, we do have a bit of a gap when it comes to rare diseases. A rare disease is one in which affects less than 200,000 people in the United States, and, and this piece is important, it is a disease in which there is no reasonable expectation that the cost of developing or making available a drug for such a disease will be recovered from the sales of such a drug. So because of that, out of approximately 7,000 rare diseases, only 5% of them have any kind of treatment. The Rare Disease Advisory Council will be responsible for developing recommendations relating to quality and access of treatment, developing of lists of publicly accessible resources for patients and for providers, identifying best practices of care, and identifying the unique problems faced by patients with rare diseases and their families. This bill came to life by and with the advocacy of Erica Barnes, who is a fierce woman who lost her little girl, Chloe, to a rare disease. Erica will tell you that once you start down this journey, due to the lack of resources in rare diseases, you become your lonely advocate. You are in charge of finding the appropriate physician, traveling, getting lodging, and even doing your own research. Diagnosing and treating a rare disease is extremely difficult, costly, and time-consuming. So by having a hub that families can access and by having this hub that physicians can access, the goal of this bill is to remove barriers and make the journey of all those who come after Erica and Chloe less challenging. I ask for your support today. Further discussion to the amendment. Madam Speaker, I think I stole the floor. Oh, Representative Lucero. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So we have the amendment here. It's the A2 amendment to Senate File 973. Is Senate file 973 being passed around so we can read that? Are you asking somebody to yield? Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I'm asking you. Do you have a point of parliamentary inquiry? Madam Speaker, point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point of parliamentary inquiry. Is Senate file 973, the Senate file to the amendment, the A2 that we're discussing, being passed around so members can read the underlying bill that we're seeking to amend? Uh, Representative Lucero, if a member um, wants a copy of the bill that is being d um, discussed or amended, um, you can um, get one online or you can ask a page to bring you a bill. 
Further discussion to the amendment, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is my understanding that this amendment puts, it in the, puts the bill in the same format as the Senate, so it'll go directly to the governor's desk. I would encourage members to support adoption of the amendment. Any further discussion to the amendment? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the adoption of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 973, as amended. Third reading. Discussion. The member from Sherburne, Representative Zerwas. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Members, I want to start by thanking uh, Representative Mann, the author of the bill. I'd also like to thank uh, Leader Winkler, Leader Doubt, and Leader Draskowski. Uh, for bringing the three caucuses together and agreeing to suspend the rules to move this forward. It was uh, the House's intention um, that this bill um, would be included within either the HHS or the Higher Education uh, Omnibus Bill. This is a provision that did pass uh, last year um, from both bodies and unfortunately was vetoed uh, by the governor. Um, it's an issue that I've worked on uh, for several years now. It's something that's uh, very close uh, to me and my family. Um, rare diseases impact families around the world and certainly here in Minnesota. And Representative Mann is correct in that when a family goes through something like this, when you are the only child in a state uh, with this diagnosis, or maybe with one of just a handful of children in an area that has gone through this. And I say children, members, because in most instances with rare diseases, there is no treatment, there is no cure, and there aren't many adults with rare diseases because they're terminal before adulthood. Uh, Members, families going through this certainly feel alone and on an island and very, very scared. They often find themselves trying to advocate for their own child's care. They often find themselves trying to get certain sets of doctors or specialists to talk to each other or to call each other or I just read this article from a medical journal and would this help my child? And they feel like they're on this journey by themselves. When I talk about being younger and sick and in the hospital with my parents, the one thing my mom brings up constantly is when I went through most of my challenges, was prior to Facebook and social media and the internet. And my mom often tells the story of when I would go to the pediatric cardiologist and my mom would see a five-year-old boy with tricuspid atresia and she would break down in tears because that meant that a child could live to be five. And then when she saw a seven-year-old boy, a few years later, she would break down in tears because that meant there was a chance that her son could maybe live to be seven. Members, just a few days ago, on May 17th, I celebrated a special anniversary. In May 17th, 1987, I was the first person to undergo the Fontan procedure and survive that surgery from the Minneapolis uh, Children's Hospital. That procedure at that time, when they told my parents that that was their only shot, my parents said, what are the odds? What are the chances that my son will make it through? And Dr. Stone and my surgeon, Dr. Nikoloff, told my parents, there's an 80% chance of failure and that the surgery will not be a success. But if you do nothing, there is no way your child will live another year. 
And so we went in, and my parents kissed their seven-year-old boy and gave him a hug. And he went in for an experimental surgery. I woke up, I was taken off the, off the anesthesia, and started to wake up two days later. And I'll never forget when my mom was sitting next to me and held up my hand and picked up a mirror and put it in my face. And the tears that streamed down my cheeks for the first time in my life. My lips were pink, they weren't blue. My fingernails were pink, they weren't purple. And I looked like a normal child. And I knew that I was going to be OK. Members, this journey is so isolated and scary and so terrifying. Putting together a advisory council through the University of Minnesota, it won't, unfortunately, ease the pain of families. And it won't, it won't even do much to mitigate the stress. But what it will do is it will show that those parents are not alone. And those families, those families have resources available to help them in their journey. It's an honor to have been able to work on this bill the last few sessions. And it's an honor uh, that we're taking time out tonight in a very hectic end of session to make this bill a reality. Again, members, thank you to the majority for allowing this to occur. Thank you. I urge you a green vote. And let's show that even in the most cynical political times, we have time to pause for miracles. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And further discussion? Representative Mann. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would like to thank all of the authors on this bill, including Representative Zerwas. Thank you for sharing your story. And thank you for your words. I could not have said it better. Uh, I'd like to thank Senator Miller for his tireless advocacy on this issue. And lastly, I would also like to thank Erica Barnes for being the incredible human being that she is. And with that, I ask for your green vote. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill as amended. The clerk will close the roll. There being 133 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The member from Hennepin, Representative Winkler. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, members, we will uh, obviously be reconvening again before midnight, but for right now, uh, we're waiting to see if a bill will come over from the Senate, a conference report. And so uh, in a minute, I'll move a recess to the call of the chair, but I would suggest members not go too far. Representative Winkler moves a recess to the call of the chair. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. The motion prevails and we are in recess to the call of the chair.